Welcome to 3ABN's Sabbath School panel. My name is John Dinsey, and I am glad to be with you because we have another interesting study with the 3ABN Sabbath School panel family. We are working our way through lesson managing for the master till he comes. This is lesson number nine, entitled Beware of Covetousness. I would like to introduce to you the panelists that are here, the Trivian family, Sister Gio Morricone. Thank you, Brother Johnny. I have Monday and a cursed thing in the camp. Great. Pastor John Lomacan. Wow, mine is entitled The Heart of Judas. Hmm. <laughs> Excellent. Evangelist Brian Day. All right, I have Wednesday's lesson, and we're going to be talking about Ananias and Sapphira. Wonderful. And Shelly Quinn. I have Thursdays. It is overcoming covetousness. And I used to always say that wrong. I used to say covetousness, but... <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Thank you so much. We'd like to begin with a prayer, and we're going to ask Pastor John Lowe McCann if he would do the favor for us. Sure. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, it's always a privilege when we walk through a door that has on the other side of it knowledge that is yours and divine. Lord, take our human minds and merge it with yours that these words become life to us not just words we've studied and mm -hmm. lessons that we have communicated, but may they imbibe in our souls. May we digest them and may they change us as we seek to guide others, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. The lesson is entitled, Beware of Covetousness. You know, when you think of this, you have to ask yourself, what does this mean? Mm -hmm. There's danger in this life threatening danger. I would like to read for you the memory text taken from Luke chapter 12 and verse 15. Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Excellent choice for a memory text. And when you look at the word covetousness, uh, it says here in the lesson, it has been defined as an inordinate desire for wealth or possessions that really don't belong to you. And according to the lesson, it says it's so damaging that God chose to warn against it in his great moral law. As a matter of fact, covetousness is frequently listed in the those terrible uh, sins that... Uh, bring about God's wrath for those sinners. In this week's lesson, we're going to look at examples of just how bad this is. So I encourage you to follow along, and I hope you have your Bible with you because we're going to share some scriptures with you that we hope you will continue to study. Sunday's lesson is entitled, The Ultimate Original Sin. The Ultimate Original Sin. Where does this begin? And when we call original, that means there was not one before it. That means there was one right after this one. This takes us to talk about an angel that was a covering cherub, Lucifer. And before I go to the scripture pointed out in the lesson, I'd like to back up a little and bring you first to Ezekiel chapter 28 to establish that he was created perfect. In Ezekiel 28, using the symbol of the king of Tyre, it talks about Lucifer. And you know it's talking about him because of the context and the words used. Notice Ezekiel 28, 14 and 15. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. Notice verse 15. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. And we're going to talk about that iniquity in a moment. But notice that it says he was created perfect. That means he was perfect from the day he was created. And as long as it was until iniquity was found in him. And I like to highlight the fact that God did not put uh, any uh, defect in Lucifer. He was Perfect, perfect. And the word that is used here that is uh, translated was found is a Hebrew word that when you look deep into it, it is as if you investigate deeply and you come to a conclusion based on what you found then. 
In essence, it is saying to us that Lucifer was perfect from the very second he was created and continued to be perfect until sin arose in his mind. He was created with freedom of choice and he chose to sin on his own. God did not put a, uh, you will fail after so many days, you will fail or uh, sin will, will uh, pop up in you or, or, or grow in you uh, because God put something there. It was of his own doing. And there's really no explanation because he was in a perfect environment. Everything was perfect around him. There was no reason for what took place. In Isaiah chapter 14, the lesson brings out verses 12 through 14 that we're going to look at. And it says, how you are fallen from heaven, yeah. O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. So we are uh, here to understand that this uh, original sin took place in heaven. Notice verse 13, for you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregations on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yeah. Did he really want to be like the most high? The Bible says that God is love. So he desired something that did not belong to him. He's not worthy of it because only God is worthy to sit on that throne. So this is the origin or where the original covetousness began. In the lesson, I read to you from uh, there. It has a quote from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 35. Not content with his position, Though honored above the heavenly host, he ventured to covet homage due alone to the Creator. Instead of seeking to make God supreme in the affections and allegiance of all created things, it was his endeavor to secure their service and loyalty to himself. And coveting the glory with which the infinite Father had invested his Son, this Prince of angels, aspired to power that was the prerogative of Christ alone. Mm -hmm. He coveted something wow. that he could not possibly have. It was not his. It would never be his. For he was created an angel and he's below the creator. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 5 tells us this. For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man or woman who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. So uh, when we look at this issue of covetous, and we're talking about managing finances, managing things, uh, here we have that covetousness. You, if this is the way you live, you will not have the inheritance of the kingdom of God. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, brings more for our understanding. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Mm -hmm. This is idolatry. Yes. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked, when you lived in them. So Paul here is uh, addressing the Colossians and he's telling them to beware of this because the wrath of God is coming upon those that have this practice. And you know, and this sin is something that is not necessarily seen right away uh, outwardly. It's something that you can do in your mind. It is dangerous and it is a poison. Now Paul does present to us better choices. Colossians chapter 3, and uh, we'll begin in verse 8. But now you yourselves are to put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your speech. Do not lie one to another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Moving to verse 12, we have... 
Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long suffering, mm -hmm. bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, what should you do? Even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called. So we see here that we need to replace this covetousness, which is a poison that will eat away at you. You know, it's interesting that uh, the scriptures point to us that this was one of the things that Paul had a, a, uh, a challenge with. He said, I would not have known sin except the law said, thou shalt not covet. Mm -hmm. So coveting is something that is dangerous and Satan seeks to work this idea or put this in uh, the minds of every one of us. And you know, he puts thoughts in our minds. Don't you want what he has? Don't you want what she has? Uh, you know you can do better than what you're doing. Look at what they are driving. Look what they are wearing. And so this is a dangerous, dangerous thing. And notice that you identify with the devil desiring something that does not belong to you. Now, uh, we move to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, and the question is, how can focusing on what Paul writes here help protect us from covetousness? 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. And we have much to be thankful for. God is so good to us that He gives to us that which will bring us happiness. And it says in verse 7, For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. So this is a fact. You know, uh, uh, the man, our lives do not consist in the things that we possess. I read to you now from Romans chapter 7, which I mentioned earlier. Romans chapter 7, uh, verse 7. For what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary. I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. You remember that Paul said, concerning the law, blameless. <laughs> but this is something. I mean, the outward uh, life of Paul, hey, he is blameless. Doesn't say anything wrong. Doesn't do anything wrong. Doesn't even dress wrong. He's blameless. But Paul understood that he too needed the grace of Christ because in him was covetousness. So beware of covetousness. Thank you so much, Brother Johnny. What a great lesson, great foundation for this entire lesson on covetousness and that origin with Lucifer in heaven. I'm Jill Morricone. On Monday, we look at an accursed thing in the camp. I can hardly get that out. An accursed thing in the camp. We're looking, of course, at Achan's covetousness, and we're going to the book of Joshua. So turn there with me. We have 10 takeaways from jo uh, Achan's sin there. Before we get to the battle at Ai, just a little backstory. Remember, they'd wandered the children of Israel 40 years in the wilderness. They crossed the Jordan River on dry ground by a miracle from God. The walls of Jericho had come tumbling down by a miracle from God. Now we pick up and go into the command. This is actually just before the walls of Jericho came down. Um, God, through Joshua, had given a command to the people. And we'll read that because that's important to the story. We're in Joshua 6, verses 17 through 19. Joshua 6, 17 through 19. Now the city, this is talking about Jericho, shall be doomed by the Lord to destruction, it and all who are in it. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all who are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And you by all means abstain from the accursed things. We're gonna hear that word a lot. Lest you become accursed when you take of the accursed things and make the camp of Israel a curse. Four times that word is used there and trouble it. 
But all the silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron are consecrated to the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. Clearly it's delineated what they need to do. Everything is to be destroyed. Nothing is to be spared. The only thing is Rahab and her house. And then the silver and gold was to go into the treasury. Takeaway number one, beware lest you ignore God's instructions. This is a heavy topic for me, this entire um, study. Beware lest you ignore God's instructions. God gives clear instructions, His Ten Commandment law. His Word clearly tells us what we're supposed to do as Christians today in these last days. Beware if you ignore those instructions. Let's jump into the sin. Now we're going over to Joshua chapter 7, verse 1. But the children of Israel committed a trespass. That word trespass means to act undercover, underhandedly, treacherously. They committed a trespass uh, regarding the accursed things, the things they were supposed to beware of, they were supposed to leave alone. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed things. So the anger of the Lord burned against Achan. Is that what it says? The anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. Mm -hmm. Takeaway number two, beware lest your sin affects others. Mm -hmm. It was Achan's sin, was it not? Achan's the one who committed the sin. He's the one who kept the accursed things. And yet the anger of God burned not just against Achan, but against the children of Israel. We think it only affects me, my sin. It doesn't bother anybody else. It's private. It's personal. It's not impacting anybody. No. Beware lest your sin affects someone else. Let's read verse 2, Joshua 7, verse 2. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai and spoke to them, saying, Go up and spy out the country. So the men went up and spied out Ai, verse 3. And they returned to Joshua, and what did they say? Do not let all the people go up. We got this. Let only two or 3,000 men go into battle. Do not weary the people. For the people of Ai are few. Takeaway number three, beware when you fail to consult God. It was very clear that Joshua had had an encounter with the pre-incarnate Christ before the walls of Jericho came tumbling down, right? He received instruction from God. He sought the Lord. How are we to overcome this city? In this case, it doesn't say Joshua went to the Lord. It doesn't say he asked for counsel from God on how to attack Ai. He sent some people to spy out the land. Beware when you fail to consult God. Let's read verse 4, Joshua 7, verse 4. So about 3,000 men went up from there from the people. But they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai struck down 36 men, for they chased them from before the gate as far as Shebarim, and struck them down on the descent. Therefore the hearts of the people melted and became like water. Takeaway number four, beware of self-confidence in the battle. They took their 3,000 men, we got this, there's no issue. And what happened? They turned and fled, and 36 innocent men lost their lives. Mm. How many times have I, in my own experience, I know I've done this. I've got it, God. I got it. Self-confidence. I really don't need anything. Beware of self-confidence. Now let's go after this and what happened. Let's see what happens next in verse 6. Joshua tore his clothes, fell on his face, uh, fell on the earth, to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening. He and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. We see here repentance. Joshua and the elders of Israel, we see this repentance. Now, maybe he didn't consult the Lord before going to attack Ai, but he's surely consulting the Lord now. And what does he pray? Verse 7, Joshua said, Alas, Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all? Why? Have you ever done that? You ever been involved in difficulty and it seems like the enemy overpowers you and you're in distress and why God? Why is this happening? Why? This is Joshua. God, why? Why are your people defeated? Why? 
Why did you do this? To destroy us? Oh, that we had been content and dwelt on the other side of the Jordan. Oh, Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns its back from its enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear it and surround us and cut off our name from the earth. What will you do for your great name? God, it's not just about me. It's not just about the 36 men. God, it's about your name. God, why? The next two words are very significant to me. Verse 10, the Lord said to Joshua, get up. Did I hear that correctly? He said, get up. So they're saying, why God, why this problem? Why, why? And he said, get up. Why do you lie on your face? Israel has sinned. Takeaway number five, beware of blaming God for your own sin. Mm, Beware. We say, God, why did my marriage fall apart? But I'm the one who had the affair. I'm the one who criticized. I'm the one who didn't respect my husband. God, why did I get sick? And then I... Why did I get lung cancer? I smoked cigarettes for 40 years. Why? Beware when you blame God for your own sin. What was the consequence? Verse 12, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies because they've been doomed to destruction. Neither will I be with you anymore. God speaking, I will not be with you unless you destroy the accursed thing from among you. Takeaway number six, beware lest sin separates you from God. God said, I won't be with you because of the sin in the camp. Beware lest sin separates you from God. Verse 13, God still speaking, get up, sanctify the people. Say, sanctify yourselves for tomorrow because thus says the Lord God of Israel. There is an accursed thing in your midst. Oh, Israel, you cannot stand before your enemies until you take the accursed thing away. Take away seven. Beware lest sin keep you from victory. They could not stand before their enemies. They could not be victorious because there was sin in the camp. Verse 15, then it shall be that he who is taken with the accursed thing shall be burned with fire, he and all that he has, because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord and because he's done a disgraceful thing in Israel. Take away eight, beware of the consequences of sin. Hmm. The lots were cast, they were fell upon Achan. And then Achan comes forward and says in verse 21, I saw all the spoils and I coveted and took and I hid them in my tent. Takeaway nine, beware of hidden sin, the sin that's not easily visible. Covetousness is a hidden sin. Finally, we see the judgment. Verse 24, Joshua and all Israel took Achan, the son of Zareph, his garment, the wedge of gold, his sons. Did you catch that? His daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, all that he had, they brought him to the valley of Achor. They stoned him with stones and burned them with fire. Take away 10. Beware, lest you hold on to sin until it affects those in your family. Mm-hmm. Beware. This is a serious topic. Mm-hmm. God wants us to beware of any sin in our lives because he wants to forgive and cleanse and restore us. Amen, amen. Praise the Lord, thank you very much. Well, friends, we're gonna take a short break and we will be back in just a moment. Ever wish you could watch a 3 Abian Sabbath School panel again? or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Well, you can by visiting 3abnsabbathschoolpanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Welcome back. We are dealing with the lesson, Beware of Covetousness. What a blessing it has been so far. Thank you, Sister Jill, for that last powerful message. We continue this study with Pastor John Lomaken. Wow, the heart of Judas. What a topic. There's so many uh, parallels, so many lessons from the life of Judas. One of those I'd like to reiterate, I think I'll mention it now and mention it again at the end. The unresolved sins will become the very incarceration of your eternity. The things that you refuse to resolve will be things that will spell your destiny. Judas's life, a life of 
How many of us would love to have the kind of life he had, to walk with Jesus physically, visibly, every day to be by his side, to be in his presence, to see the miracles that transformed thousands performed by the very master that he called. And yet to end with a life record that goes on to perpetually tell us of what he forfeited eternally. It's one of the most tragic stories in the Bible. Thank you, Jill, for handling a topic that is so delicate yet so necessary, how sometimes we blame God for the very things that we are responsible for. And this is another example of one who lost at the very end of his opportunities, forfeited the greatest gift that was given to him. Let's start in John chapter 12, and we're going to lay some foundation for the very heart of this man, the heart of Judas. You know, you'll discover along the way in your life, your heart shows you who you are. When you see who God shows you to be, do not ignore it. Another way to say it, if somebody shows you who they are, believe it. If someone reveals their character to you, believe it. By ignoring and denying what God shows you can spell your downfall. John chapter 12, a very delicate moment when Jesus is being anointed, someone named Judas appeared to be in the midst. John 12, verse 1 to 8. Then six days, then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. Wow, Lazarus used to be dead. Now he's at the dinner. Yeah. He's at the dinner now. It's good. What a what a what a mark testament to the power in Christ. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus. One of those who sat at the table with Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. You know, the presence of Lazarus, I need to say this, was a constant rebuke to the Jews mm. that Jesus was not the Messiah. Mm. It was evidence of his Messiahship. And every time they saw Lazarus, they could not deny that he is the resurrection and the life. Mm. Verse 3 says, Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. Wow, when we are broken and spilled out for Christ, our lives become a fragrance of the presence of Christ. You know, we become a savor of life unto life. That's an example of what God wants for every one of us. I love Oswald Chambers. He talks about being broken bread and poured out wine, being mm -hmm. broken and spilled out. I did the sermon called Poured Out how when our lives are poured out for Christ, we take on value, except a grain of wheat falls into the ground and die, it's, it abides alone. Mm -hmm. And those of us who are not poured out are living a, a, a secluded life, a life devoid of the blessings that God really intended for us to experience. But she didn't. And that spikenard, that fragrant oil, cost her about a year's wages. Mm -hmm. But look at verse 4. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Verse 6. Then he said, Not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a what? A thief and had the money box and he used to take what was put in it. But Jesus said, Let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. You know, the writer of the lesson, uh, uh, Elder Reed, pointed out some very significant questions. What did Mary do that attracted so much attention during the feast? Now, I want you to get this. What did Mary do that attracted so much, so much attention to the feast? What she did attracted attention not to her, but to the one that was anointed. When we do what God calls us to do, it will attract attention to the one that must be exalted, That's to right. the only anointed one. We are not called to attract attention to ourselves like Judas did. Mm -hmm. We are called to be the Mary at the feet of Jesus, pouring out our best on the master, attracting all the joys and all the sorrows and all the glad tidings to the one who can deliver us, the one who can bless us, the one who can take our lives from a downtrodden state to an exalted one only for his glory. But how did Judas, Judas react? <laughs> this money could have been used for better reasons. Watch out when people make majors out of minors. Now, this was not a minor moment, 
But Judas decided to point this major, this major service of anointing, preparing Jesus for his burial. This was greater than just breaking a bottle and pouring out ointment. This was a symbol that she was there for Christ. And that, that's why when Jesus was raised, all of the fear in the world could not get Mary to, mm-hmm. to, to abandon the tomb. Mm-hmm. Where, are, where have they laid my Lord? And she waited there and was the first to embrace her Lord. How beautiful was her dedication to Christ. But Jesus even calmly rebuked Judas. He didn't even make Judas an example. He chose not to turn away that precious moment to a man whose heart was so destitute of, of, of joy and dedication to his Lord, which tells me in moments when people turn the moment away from the chief focus of the moment, don't engage them to rob that moment of the great blessing that's there. We could argue with people over something that will take the glory from Christ and put the glory on themselves. Don't allow those who redirect the praise of God to a moment of tragedy. Verse 5 and 6, we find the focal point of the story. Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii? He even gave a price. He said, this is worth a whole lot more than this moment. Really? Is the oil worth more than the Lord? Absolutely not. The value was not in the cost of the oil, but in the limitless cost of the Savior. And he missed that. How can you be with someone every day and miss their inestimable value? Wow, he missed that moment. The heart of Judas, Matthew chapter 26, verse 14 to 16. Then one of the 12 called Judas Iscariot went to the chief priest and said, what are you willing to give me if I deliver you to him? Mm. And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. So from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. Mm. That was really the motive behind this moment. I have to find a way to betray him. And that's why we find in Philippians chapter 3, verse 18 and 19, For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now I tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. How can you be with Jesus and end up becoming an enemy of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things? So we have here the, the, the examples from Judas. We must not allow money to be above our allegiance to Jesus. 1 Timothy 3, verse 8, not greedy for filthy lucre, or as the New King James says, not greedy for money. There are some people that are close to Christ, even claim to be ministers of Christ, but the focus is money. They use God for financial gain. Thus, the many ministries that we find on television, and I want to say this, praise God, that is not the focus of 3ABN. We don't use this ministry for financial gain. We use it for the proliferation of the everlasting gospel. And everything you give is handled humbly. I know Greg and Jill, I understand our financier. I know Jason Bergman, and I know the motive behind those who work here. We want to get the gospel of Christ out to the world. We do not beg for money for personal gain. Praise God for that. But we have some takeaways, and I need to get to that before my time uh, expires. But let me just point out a couple of things. This is the generation motivated by financial gain. 2 Timothy 3, verse 2, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money. And that's the, the generation we live in. And I hate to say this, but even many people that open churches and open ministries have the same motive. They use Jesus Christ for financial gain. Mm-hmm. The many mansions, the many houses, the many jets, the many cars, the many Rolls Royces, the lavish lifestyles, but they claim to be connected to Christ. What are the tragic lessons from Judas? Let me bring those to the forefront and I'll leave the rest for the latter part of the program. The tragedy of Judas is this, having so much, he settled for so little. The tragedy of Judas is this, being so close, his life ended so far. Mm -hmm. The tragedy of Judas is this, he pursued that which cost him everything and ignored that which cost him nothing. Mm -hmm. The tragedy of Judas is those that betray others really betray themselves. The tragedy of Judas is this, he conspired to arrest the innocent one, but became incarcerated by his guilt. The heart of Judas, Don't use Jesus for your own personal gain. Don't claim to be so close to the Messiah and yet miss that which he offers. Abandon the heart of Judas and embrace the heart of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys so much for that. Appreciate it, Pastor. Man, what you were just sharing, just uh, what came into my mind is we live in an era, live in a time in which many are prostituting the gospel. And it's just uh, a sad thing indeed. I have Wednesday's lesson entitled Ananias and Sapphira. My name is Ryan Day, 
and uh, it is a blessing to be able to share this truth. You know, it's a, it's a story that uh, we don't really focus on very often. We don't have many people that, you know, account or give account to this story m many times because it, it doesn't have a very pleasant ending. But there are certainly some lessons that we can learn from this. And, uh, you know, the, the lesson brings out that it was an exacting time uh, at this particular time in history, talking about the first century uh, AD, right after Christ obviously had died, the church was booming, it was growing uh, greatly, especially from Pentecost and onward. I mean, there were tons of people coming into the church and their lives were being changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, Acts chapter 4, verses 31 and 32 reminds us, it says, and, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken from where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of these things which he possessed was his own, but they all, or they had all things in common. So in this case, you know, there was a, there was a sense of unity. There was a sense of substantial growth. The spirit of the Lord was moving mightily during this time. And of course it got the attention of a couple by the name of Ananias and Sapphira. And the lesson brings out that what a privilege Ananias and Sapphira, two people had uh, being part of this early church, seeing it grow and seeing the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in such a marked manner. And of course, uh, it brings out in Acts chapter 4 verses 34 and 35. It says, Nor was there anyone among them who lacked for who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them in the apostles' feet or at the apostles' feet and they distributed to each as anyone had need. So this was a great impression upon Ananias and Sapphira as they were seeing just the mighty works of God taking place. And of course it was in this setting that Ananias and Sapphira obviously impressed by what was happening and wanted to be a part of it, decided to sell some property and contribute the proceeds to the church. Sounds good so far, right? Well, let's read the story. Let's go to Acts chapter 5 and let's read verses 1 through 11 because the Bible uh, gives us some clear insight on what actually happened. Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, it says, But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds his wife also being aware of it and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was, after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So, of course, great fear came over all those who heard these things. And the young men arose and wrapped him up, carried him out and buried him. Verse 7 says, Now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. When Peter answered her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She said, Yes. For so much. Then Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have, who have buried your husband and at the door, and they will carry you out. Oh. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. Mm -hmm. And the young men came in and found her dead, and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all those who heard these things. I mean, my goodness. Uh, and then just those words just ring out. You have not lied to men. You're not, you're not pulling, you may pull the wool over the men's eyes, but you have lied to God. You're, you can't get anything past God. God knows all, He sees all. And of course, at first it seemed as if they were sincere, of course, in their desire to give toward the work. However, afterwards, as, uh, as Mrs. White brings out in the Acts of the Apostles, page 72, afterwards Ananias and Sapphira grieved the Holy Spirit by yielding to the feelings of covetousness. They began to regret their promise and soon lost the sweet influence of the blessing that had warmed their hearts with the desire to, to do large things in behalf of the cause of Christ. Uh, but of course, you know, in other words, though they had started out with the best of motives, you know, they wanted to be a part of this great work, their covetousness caused them to put on a front and pretend to be what they really weren't. Mm. 
And this reminds me, as we, as we have heard this word many times, covetousness, covetousness. This all goes back to the heart, the very heart of God's very commandments. Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. What does it say there in God's very law? It says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. In other words, don't, don't put this before God. Don't put this before even your own salvation to, to chase after those things which are not yours or that God may not have plan or will for you to have in your life. If we dig a little deeper and we study a little deeper, you'll, you'll eventually end up in Colossians chapter 3 where you're reading the first five verses where it actually brings out the heart of the matter because many people question and say, well, well if I see something and I want it, is that, a, is that a sin? Well, it goes a little deeper than just seeing something and wanting something or desiring something. If you go to Colossians chapter 3 verses 1 through 5, we get kind of a glimpse into what is at the heart of this covetous or coveting as it is a sin. For Colossians 3 verses 1 through 5 says, If you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, which Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And verse 4, When Christ who is our life appears, mm -hmm. then you also will appear with Him in glory. And then verse 5, here it is. Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth. And what are those things we are to put to death? Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire. And here it is, covetousness. But then it says, which is idolatry. Mm -hmm. Did you catch that? What is at the heart of this covetousness? What is at the heart of, of, of the sin of coveting? It's idolatry. It's putting others or anything above God and not putting God first in your life. Of course, Pastor Denzi read the Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5, which repeats this. It says, for this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, or covetous man, and then it says, who is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. It, you know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist. All you have to do is be able to study and read a little bit. Go back and just survey the story of the Old Testament and you will see that it was the sin of idolatry that led to much calamity and much destruction and, and the end of many. For instance, it was idolatry uh, that led Lot's wife to turn into a pillar of salt. Uh, she, she, she made uh, her life in Sodom and the things and her possessions and everything she had made there. It was an idol to her. She coveted that and she couldn't let it go in her heart. It was idolatry that led 3,000 people of the camp of Israel to be slain in Exodus chapter 32. They worshiped the golden calf. God, Moses said, either you're going to worship the Lord or you're not. You're going to be on the Lord's side or you're not. There were 3,000 of them that went against it and they lost their life that day because they'd rather have the calf than have God. Hmm. Idolatry led 24,000 Israelites to be slain before entering the promised land. Mo the Moabitess women came in, turned their hearts to serving Baal. They made it an idol and it cost them their life. It was idolatry that led, Solom led to Solomon's demise and a permanent division of Israel. It was idolatry that led to a three and a half year drought in Israel during the days of Ahab. It was idolatry that led to the scattering of the 10 tribes of the north and the end of the northern kingdom of Israel. It was idolatry that led, Israel, uh, d led to Israel evicting God from his own sanctuary. And it was idolatry ultimately that led to the complete destruction of Israel and set, of course to 70 years of Babylon Babylonian captivity, the, of course, the Mecca of idolatry, which of course is Babylon. You know, you can read there in Jeremiah chapter 7. I don't have time. I had it here in my notes, but you just go read Jeremiah chapter 7 and you can just see God's heart pouring out as he has been pleading and pleading and pleading with Israel for 840 years to trust in him, to put him first above anything and anyone else. But yet it leads to him saying the most, the most heart-wrenching words that you could ever hear from your God, to hear the prophet of God, Jeremiah, to hear these words that come from God. And he says, therefore, Jeremiah, do not pray for these people. Stop praying for them. Wow. Hmm. Nor lift up a cry of prayer for them, nor make intercession to me, for I will not hear you. They had reached a point where they had completely turned their back on God. They would rather have the world. They would rather have the golden calf than to have God. But Jesus says in Matthew 10, verses 37 to 39, He says, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. 
And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross up and follow after me is not worthy of me. Have you put Jesus first in your life? Is there something that you are coveting? Is there covetousness or idolatry in your heart? It's, that's not the end. Just simply call out to the Lord and say, Lord, I don't want this to dominate my life anymore. And give your heart to Jesus today while you have time. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I'm telling you, this is really a heavier lesson than I had thought. Uh, I've got the good part. My name is Shelley Quinn. I have Thursday. I get to talk about overcoming covetousness. You know, when God has always, from the very beginning, had a moral code of love, through this moral code of love, he sets boundaries around relationships, our relationship with him and our relationship with others. And the moral code of love is finally called in Exodus, the Ten Commandments. Let me repeat the tenth. This is one that many of us think, oh, okay, you're not supposed to have uh, any idols before God. You're not supposed to bow down to them. You're not supposed to take his name in vain. You're not supposed to do this, that, and the other. Don't, you know, you got to honor your mother and father. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't bear false testimony. And we, we go through these and we get down. Don't covet like it's mm -hmm. nothing. Right. Mm -hmm. To me, I think that Covetousness it is what leads to greater sins. Covetousness mm -hmm. causes us to murder others. That's true. Covetousness causes us to steal. Covetousness causes adultery. So let me just take a second, go back through our definition, because my definition of covetousness is a little bit different. It is just the opposite of contentment. It's greed. You want more, 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 more money, more power, more prestige, whatever it is, it is idolatry. You desire to possess something someone else has, an insatiable desire for wealth, obsessions to have more material things. I got to have a new boat. I got to have this. Because when your heart covets something with an insatiable desire, you begin to do things that are outside of God's will to get it. It's a greediness that basically denies faith in God and scorns his values. And let me tell you something. It is a self-inflicted wound. Covetousness will ruin your life, but as Jill brought out, it can also, no sin happens in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. Covetousness can ruin your family's mm -hmm. life. Um, the study guide said, I love this. It's a matter of the heart. It is deadly. It's deceiving. It's like pride and selfishness. It often goes unnoticed. And yet this is a scary sin. So how do we recognize it? Well, do you feel envious or jealous when someone else is blessed? And you say, well, why them and not me? Mm -hmm. Maybe you manipulate others to get what you want because yeah. you think I deserve it. It's a general, if you have a general lack of contentment that leads to bitterness, that's covetousness. A sense of under achievement, competing for status with others mm -hmm. is covetousness. Mm -hmm. Spending money you don't have at those Black Friday sales, <laughs> that's covetousness. <laughs> Jesus warned in Luke 12, 15, take heed and beware of covetousness for one's life does not consist of the abundance that he possesses. And then I believe we've already read, but I'll repeat Ephesians 2, Five, five through seven. For this you know, no fornicator, unclean person, covetous man, idolater, the covetous man who is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Covetousness can keep you out of the kingdom. That's right. Let no one deceive you with empty words, Paul goes on to say. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. 
covetousness is disobeying God. Therefore, mm. he says, do not be partakers with him. How do we overcome? Quickly, I want to give you seven steps to overcome covetousness. Number one, recognize this is a projection of Satan's spirit coming over you. Mm. Just as Pastor uh, Johnny Dinsey, we saw Satan coveted God, the worship that God was receiving. He coveted that position of control. And you know what? He's going to do anything he can to, di to divert your focus and destroy your peace and lead you to covet so that he can lead you into greater sin. So what the second step is repent. You know, ask God, oh Lord, show me my heart. Uh, show me what's going on in my heart. And when he does, ask, ask him for forgiveness. First John 1, 9 says that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sin and cleanse us of all unrighteousness and pray for the gift of repentance. Say, Lord, grant me repentance. Step three, renew your focus on walking in covenant relationship with the Lord. You know what? If you're focused on the Lord and His righteousness and a relationship of love with Him, you're going to be like Joshua. Joshua 24, 15. He, he says, hey, choose you this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And when you're focused on that, you're not going to be focused on all of this temporal stuff. Mm -hmm. Number four, reach out to God in daily prayer, asking him to deliver you from evil. God will never lead you into temptation. As a matter of fact, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, no temptation has overcome and you except is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation, he'll make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Right. You know, I, I really think a good dose in our prayer, a good dose of thanksgiving and praise mm -hmm. will help you overcome covetousness. Mm -hmm. I, I think 80 to 90 percent of my prayer is thanksgiving and praise, and it cultivates in us a spirit of contentment. Right. Number five, regularly, I said it, regularly, um, <laughs> study your Bible. Psalm 119, 11, he says, your word I've hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Sometimes we're sinning in ignorance. Doesn't mean it's not sin, but we're ignorant of our sin because we don't know the word. And really, we don't have much excuse when the word is so available to us. First John 2.15 says, Do not love the things of this world. Mm -hmm. So as you study the Bible and you see that and you're going, Oh, Lord, I am in love with the things mm -hmm. of this world. So it helps to course correct you. And number six, remedy the spirit of covetousness by returning tithes and offerings. I'll tell you what, when, when you do that, it does help you get rid of covetousness. Mm -hmm. Celebrate the good fortune of others. I remember, I, I guess I shouldn't say, I remember someone I know who was very blessed by the Lord. They told us the story and JD and I were just celebrating and thinking, oh Lord, how wonderful. And then there were other people who were going, well, why should they get that? Just because blah, 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 blah. And it's like, what? We need to celebrate other people's when they are blessed. And number seven, remember you are a child of God. He wants to bless you. He wants to give you an abundance of everything, but he does. He gives us abundantly so that we will be equipped to, to, for every good work. Right? And remember, it's his perfect timing. He has an inheritance laid up for you in heaven. 
We all have a desire for physical things. It's not wrong, but it's a threat to us if we become fixated with it. Colossians 4.14, real quickly. Damas was one of Paul's closest companions and a disciple of Christ. But in 2 Timothy 4.10, Paul says, Damas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. The love of the world overtook Damas. Mm -hmm. The love of the world can over can displace our love for God. So if you recognize yourself at all in this, repent and ask God to cleanse you. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Sister Shelley. What a blessing it has been to hear each and every one of you. I'd like to give each one of you a moment to give a final thought. It is a heavy lesson. I know we've said that several times. I'm reminded of the promise, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He always reveals to us what's the state of our heart so that we can turn back to Him. So today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your heart. Yes, perfect segue, Jill, because the answer to the heart of Judas is the prayer of David. Psalm 51, verse 10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Because God can create the world, He can recreate your heart. Submit it to Him. Amen. Covetousness does not have to be the end all. Second Chronicles 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear them from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. With God's help, we can overcome any tendency towards selfishness and covetousness and wanting more. So pray and ask God to lead you, lead you in the way everlasting where there's fullness and joy. And remember the consequences of covetousness. You can't enter the kingdom of heaven. So make God the supreme object of your desire. Thank you so much. Uh, lesson number 10 is entitled Giving Back. That's what we will be covering next time. In view of what we have discussed, I think it is good for us to go to the Lord in prayer and I invite you to join us. Our loving Heavenly Father, we are grateful because your Holy Scriptures help us understand that this is a poison that needs to get out. Mm. Help us, Lord, to allow Jesus to come in that this poison will get out. And Lord, help us to confess and forsake this if this is a part of our lives. We pray for each and every one that is hearing my voice, that they too will make that commitment to get covetousness out and allow Jesus in. In Jesus' name we ask you, amen.